I think many of us have had scenarios where we started off with good intentions and then somewhere along the lines, it fell apart. And so we're actually going to be looking at that very scenario today with Rebecca. And what we learn with Rebecca is that she started off right on track and somewhere along the lines, despite her intention, her behavior got out of hand. There were consequences for that. And the consequences didn't just affect her, but affected her family and lots of people for years to come. We're going to unpack her story more today. Stay tuned. Do you sometimes doubt if you're truly hearing God's voice or if it's really your own? Or have you been in a season where it feels like He's completely silent? Have you been praying for a way to learn how to hear His voice more clearly? Hey friends, I'm Rachel, host of the Hearing Jesus Podcast. If you are ready to grow in your faith and to confidently step into your identity in Christ, then join me as we dig deep into God's Word so you can learn to live out your faith in your everyday life. Hey friends, welcome back to the Hearing Jesus Podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Grohl. Today we are talking about Rebecca. If you're just joining us, we are working our way through the women of the Old Testament and we're going through one by one and just refreshing our memories on their stories. And just as a reminder, when we read about women or anybody in the Bible, we are looking for God in the story. I think sometimes the temptation is to think that I want to copy the behavior and the character of the people in the story, but really we want to copy the behavior and the character of God in the story because he is the hero of any story, but yet he uses broken people to accomplish his plan. For that, I'm so thankful. So Rebecca, Rebecca is the wife of Isaac, and we actually see her story throughout Genesis. She's in there quite a bit. There's a lot about Rebecca. And so I'm going to summarize some of the chapters of scripture and then read some of them. So we're not reading three entire chapters of scripture, but I want you to get an overarching idea of her story, her storyline that we read about in Genesis. So Rebecca comes on the scene because Abraham at this point is getting old. He tells his oldest servant to swear to him that he will find a wife for Isaac, his son, and he doesn't want somebody from the Canaanites, but from his own native country. And so Isaac must not return to that land. Instead, he must be with a woman who will be willing to follow him back to the land of the Canaanites. So the servant swears, he goes on his way and he takes camels and gifts and all sorts of things to go and try to find this wife for Isaac. So when the servant arrives in a city called Nahor, his camels are drinking from the well on the outskirts of the city. And the servant then starts to pray that God will give him success in trying to find this wife for Isaac. And he's praying that God will give him a sign. He prays that when he asks a girl for a drink, the one who offers water for his camels will be the one that will be Isaac's future wife. And so he finishes praying and Rebecca is approaching. And so the servant asks Rebecca for a drink of water and she immediately offers to draw water for his camels for the, from the well. So Rebecca finishes watering the camels and the servant gives her gold jewelry and he asks her her name. And she introduces herself as Bethuel's daughter and Nahor's granddaughter when she invites him to spend the night with her family. And so the servant gratefully is worshiping God, thanking God for his faithfulness towards Abraham for answering with this sign. And Rebecca runs home and tells everyone what has happened. Her brother Laban, come and pay attention because Laban is important later on in the story we're going to learn about tomorrow. But he comes and he welcomes the servant and he listens to everything that had happened. And after he hears what the servant had to say and about Abraham and the details of this conversation with Rebecca, Laban says that this is obviously God's doing. So the servant gives Rebecca and her family a lot more expensive gifts, and he urges them to send Rebecca to Canaan right away. And so the family asks Rebecca, what do you want to do? And she agrees to go with the servant and become Isaac's wife. Remember, she's never even seen Isaac. She's heard about Abraham because they're all part of the same family. She would have heard of Abraham, but she's never met or seen Isaac. Rebecca's family sends her off with their blessing. And so Isaac 
is now walking the field and he sees these camels approaching. And when Rebecca sees Isaac from a distance, she covers herself with her veil. And then the servant tells Isaac about this successful trip that he's had. And then Isaac takes Rebecca as his wife. What we see about Rebecca's story is that she had really good beginnings. This beginning scene, this opening scene of Rebecca's story, it's really one that is showing that she wants to be obedient to God. She wants to work within line of her family and the family line. And she hears this servant's answer to prayer and all the things that are happening. And she starts off strong. The problem is, is she doesn't finish strong. And I think one of the things that we have to be careful of in our lifetime really is recognizing that we can't stand on just the basis of the fact that we used to have good character. Instead, we have to make sure that we have godly character throughout our entire lives. And so we're introduced to Rebecca because Abraham sends the servant to look for Isaac. Then we read about the story of how Rebecca becomes and remains his only wife, his one true love. And actually a lot of scholars call the marriage of Isaac and Rebecca, one of the most romantic stories in the Bible. And you can certainly see why their, their love story from the very beginning is very, very beautiful. But then what happens is there's kind of a division. There could be a lot of reasons for that. It could be the fact that he's 20 years older than her, that he was kind of a mama's boy and is used to being served. There's a a variety of reasons. It could have been her own heart or resentment. All sorts of things could have happened. But it takes about 20 years and we start to see this deep divide between them when it's time for them to have some children. Because again, just like Sarah in Sarah's story, Rebecca was barren for a really long time and Isaac prays for her and then she conceives. But her pregnancy was really troubled, so much so that she starts praying to the Lord and she asks the Lord, what's wrong? What is happening to me? And actually, we're going to read Genesis chapter 25. I'm going to read verses 20 through 28 so you can hear exactly what she said to the Lord. It says, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean from Paddan Aram and the sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. The Lord answered his prayer and his wife, Rebecca, became pregnant. The babies jostled each other within her and she said, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other and the older will serve the younger. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first came out and was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment, so they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. So what you can see from this passage is, okay, he's 60 years old now. And in that time, in that time frame, that was pretty old. And he would have been at a stage where it would have not have been the best time to have a baby. And to be perfectly honest, I don't know that 60 year olds today can handle twin boys. I mean, that's, that's a lot. It's a lot to take in. But I think it's interesting because when we talked about Hagar, And if you didn't listen to that episode, you can go back and listen to Hagar's episode. But we talked about Hagar. She was the first woman in the Bible that God talked to. But Rebecca is the first woman on record who talks to God. And he answers her and he tells her that she's going to be having twins and that the younger son will rule over the older son. And these boys, they turn out to be complete opposites from one another. Isaac, scripture says, prefers Esau, who's an outdoorsman and he wants to be outside and he has more of a laid back nature. He's adventurous. And then Rebecca prefers Jacob and he's an indoorsman. He is a mama's boy. And we start to see the seeds of favoritism take root. And let's be honest, favoritism destroys families and it destroyed Isaac and Rebecca's relationship and their family.
I'm going to just give you a summary of chapter 27, what continues to happen. Basically, Isaac is old and he can't see very well anymore. And he calls Esau to him. Remember, Esau is the oldest. And Isaac explains that he doesn't know when he's going to die. So he wants Esau to hunt and prepare some gathering for him, some wild game for him to eat just the way that he likes it. And Rebecca overhears this and she knows what's going to happen. So she tells Jacob to d- go get two kids or two young lambs from the flock and she will prepare them for Isaac and Isaac will then give Jacob his blessing. So basically they're conspiring to trick him. Jacob worries that if Isaac touches him, he'll know that it's not Esau because Esau, remember it says he's really hairy. He's a lot hairier. So Rebecca deceives Isaac into thinking that Jacob is Esau. They put hairy fur on him and they even put it on his hands and then he takes in this meal. And remember, He can't see very well. So Isaac, feeling Jacob, thinks it's Esau. And so Jacob lies to him. He tells him that it's Esau. And Isaac wonders how the game was hunted and prepared and the meal was made so quickly. But Jacob claims that God gave him success. So not only is he lying to him, but then he's invoking the Lord's name in that lie. And so Isaac wants to feel his son and be sure that it's him. He touches this skin covered hands that that he has. And basically he's satisfied because even though his voice sounds like Jacob, he thinks it's really Esau. And he's probably doubting himself at that point. But, you know, he's thinking never would he think that this, they would go through these great lengths to trick him. And so he eats this meal that Jacob has brought, and then he kisses Jacob and blesses him. So now the blessing of the firstborn is going to go to Jacob instead of Esau, which means Jacob's brother will now have to bow down to him. No sooner than Jacob did that and tricked him and received the blessing, than what happens? Esau comes in with the game that he caught and Esau identifies himself and Isaac trembles and says that he's already given away the blessing. Then Esau is crying out. He's bitter. He's begging for his own blessing. And he is so upset about what has happened. And so basically Isaac gives Esau another blessing, but the blessing says that Esau will serve his brother. And you can imagine what this does. Esau hates Jacob for stealing his blessing and he resolves to kill Jacob after Isaac dies. But when Rebecca hears that, she orders Jacob to flee, to go back to her brother Laban's house and to stay there basically until Esau isn't angry anymore because she can't bear to lose both of her sons in one day. There's a lot happening. And what we see is Rebecca who started off well. She was beautiful and pure and hardworking and adventurous and willing to risk it all. She ups and leaves her home and her family, not even knowing where she's going. She was really kind of like Abraham in that regard. But just like Abraham's wife, Sarah, she ends up not trusting God's word that he gave her. And she takes matters into her own hands. And just like Sarah, she causes this break in her own family. And she creates this division now, which eventually becomes the basis for two people groups. So there's lasting consequences to her deception. And, you know, I have to think about the fact that perhaps she could have just talked to Isaac. She could have reminded him of what the Lord had promised about Jacob But instead, she doesn't even try that. She just deceives him. She tricks him. She betrays him. And knowing that he's old and blind and he trusts her, she manipulates the situation. And while her initial intention may have been good, what happens is her precious son Jacob ends up being sent away and she will never see him again. Because we learn later in the scriptures that she says, go away for a few days, but he stays away for 20 years and she will die before he comes back. It's really a sad ending to her story. But here's the important part. I want to make sure we don't forget. God keeps his promises and God is faithful even when we are not. Because eventually what we know is that God does include her child, Jacob, in the line of Christ because he is the redeemer of all things, despite our faithlessness, 
despite our sin, despite our brokenness, we still have a redeemer that redeems all things. He is faithful even when we are not. He keeps his promises. But there was consequences for her sin. And I want to think about that for a minute. I think sometimes as women or as moms or as parents, if you're a male that's listening, I think sometimes we think that we know what's best for our family and we demand it and maybe even we manipulate it. And maybe that is trying to manipulate what school, what college your child goes to, or maybe it is playing favoritism between your children. There's a lot of ways that that can flesh out. But what I want us to think about is placing God at the head of that relationship. Because even with our children, I think sometimes we can place them in the place of an idol. And I'm not saying that I fault Rebecca. Honestly, I probably would have done the same thing. I know myself. I know that I can be temperamental. I know that I can be impatient. I know that I can want to hurry God's plan along. I probably, given the same circumstances, would have been the same way. You know, I, I would like to hope that I wouldn't. But what I know is I have this human will and nature that is helpless without God. But I think what this boils down to is sometimes we act before praying and asking God for what we're supposed to do because God had already spoken to her. That's the the hard thing about all of this. God spoke to her. She spoke to God. God spoke to her. He comforted her. He spoke to her when she was having a hard pregnancy with the twins. And yet, instead of relying on that, on God's word being true... She took matters into her own hands and she sinned in the process. And then it had consequences because we see she never got to see Jacob again. And we know that eventually led to suffering, suffering in Jacob's life and suffering for Israel. So the means didn't really justify the end. But yet we still have a God that comes on the scene and remains faithful even when we are not. I'm so thankful for a faithful God that has a plan and a purpose that is so much bigger than what we can screw up. So I think if you have found yourself in that place where you have been manipulative, where you haven't had good communication with your spouse, where you have tried to place one child or the other, or you've just tried to manipulate situations without waiting on God, I want you to know that there's grace and there's forgiveness in that. Now, that's not what God wants you to do. Of course, his plan is for you to listen to him first, but there's grace and there's forgiveness. That doesn't mean that there's not going to be consequences. There certainly will be. I can almost guarantee guarantee that there will be consequences, but there's still grace and forgiveness. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the grace and the forgiveness that we see you offer your people over and over again, despite our inability to wait on you, to wait on your promise, to wait on your timing. Lord, I just pray for my friend today that maybe went ahead of themselves or went ahead of you and maybe sinned in the process of trying to manipulate the situation. God, would you help them to recognize that even though there's consequence, there's also grace and forgiveness, that our sin cannot mess up your plan. Now, it might mess things up for us, but it doesn't mess up your plan because you are a God that is bigger than our sin. Lord, I thank you that you sent Jesus because you knew that we couldn't do it without him, that we were going to mess up. Lord, I thank you that we have the opportunity to have a clean slate and to have forgiveness through Jesus. Lord, I pray for my friends today that they would understand how much you love them, that despite anything that we do or say or don't do or don't say, that you are there waiting with grace and forgiveness. It's in your name we ask these things. Amen. The Hearing Jesus Podcast is so excited to partner with Compassion International. We believe in Compassion's mission to release children from poverty in Jesus' name. I've seen the impact myself through the letters and the updates that I've received as a sponsor. It's not just changing the lives of children, it's changing entire families, whole communities, always through the local church and always in Jesus' name. When you sponsor a child, you ensure access to quality education, medical checkups, healthy food, 
clean water, and most importantly, the love of Jesus, delivered through a church in their community because of a generous, caring sponsor like you. And you can speak life, love, and hope to your sponsored child through personal letters that you'll exchange. I hope you'll join me in sponsoring a child through Compassion today. All you have to do is pull out your phone, open up a text, and text Hearing Jesus to 83393. You'll get back a text with a picture of a child who is waiting for a sponsor and a link to sponsor that child. You can also go to compassion.com forward slash hearing Jesus to choose a boy or a girl to sponsor. When you sponsor a child, we will send you a copy of She Hears Learning to Listen to Jesus, my Bible study, as a token of our thanks for investing in the life of a child. Thank you for joining me and sponsoring a child through Compassion today. Hey friends, if this podcast helped encourage, empower, or equip you in your walk with God, I would love it if you would head over to Apple Podcasts and leave me a review. That's the number one way you can support my show. You can also join our free Facebook community or Instagram page where I share inspirational tips, bonus content, resources, and prayer throughout the week. Hey, I want you to know I'm praying for you. Know that you are so loved. Keep going. Keep going.